Hi everyone, Ollie here and welcome back to the channel once again. Now, this is not going to be the normal kind of video I would put forward on the channel. This is going to be talking about mental health. Specifically, it's going to be talking about my own experiences of a mental health problem while I was in my first year at Warwick Medical School and how kind of how that was for me, how I dealt with it at the time. And then I'm going to talk about what structures and systems are actually in place at the medical school to support you if you have a problem that affects your mental health and what you need to do to make sure that the university is properly aware such that if it affects your exams at all, it can be dealt with as fully as possible. So I have not had any significant mental health problems before ever dealing with this. So this was like my first experience of something like this. I've had a lot of sleep problems before. Just so I can make my frame of reference as clear as possible for those of you watching, I have not ever had depression or you know anything similar to that. No PTSD, no significant past trauma, no like this is my, my first experience of anything significantly abnormal. And what essentially happened is that in the weeks preceding our Easter break, so I think this would have been mid-February I want to say some something around that like significantly after Christmas but before Easter and I'm still not technically 100% sure what the what the proper terminology is but basically I was experiencing kind of fixated uh, intrusive thoughts about um, hurting myself with with objects so an example might be that I had um, a, a razor blade for a well, for a razor obviously there was one on my desk and uh, I, I would just be studying away and this is maybe what contributed you know I was spending lots of time on my own studying um, and if there, so there was a razor blade on my desk and I just sort of snap into sort of a a different way of thinking and sort of fixate on on this blade or whatever it didn't have to be a blade but it was usually sharp objects that was the point and I'd sort of look at it and think, you know, like I could, I could cut myself with that. I could hurt myself. And then that's how it started. So this was, it was like, I could jam this pencil into my eye or something like that. It, it was, if I saw something that was, that was pointy or sharp, I would sort of go, you know, I could do that. And you'd have this little, not a, a voice, but like a thought that would, jump into my head from time to time and it started I just would think oh that's weird um, and would ignore it and carry on with what I was doing and then maybe it would come back a few days later and I'd have it for maybe maybe 15 seconds or something it was really transient and ephemeral it didn't last and then as we got further on further on I was getting more stressed because of exams and things and uh, then it started not getting worse because that's not the word I would use, but I would start doing things like in the case of a razor blade, I might pick it up and put it, um, you know, over my wrist or something like right up to the point where I could feasibly hurt myself with it. And because we have in my family a, a strong um, tendency, it seems, towards things like depression and low mood and my cousin um, actually took her own life quite some time ago and, and I didn't know her very well um, so that's not a you know it was a horrible thing that happened but it hasn't had a long lasting impact on me that's not the point uh, but I was worried obviously um, we have this tendency towards self-harm so I thought at this point right I should go and get myself checked out. So from there, I tried to see my tutor at the medical school. She was unfortunately off sick, but um, that was sorted really quickly. I went to see the senior tutor or deputy senior tutor. I'm not sure what the proper title is, but um, I went to see them. There was a stand in for me and I spoke to her. She was lovely. I, I obviously even now I'm finding this difficult to explain to you guys, but she gave me some really good advice, talked me through how I should approach um, kind of recording it such that the medical school could help me if I needed help and told me what services might be good to go and check out with the NHS and I'd actually um, been to see my GP about it as well 
and I got the same um, the same advice. So I went to see, I think it's called the IAPT team. I, I, I didn't see them, but I had a phone call with them. And I was screened for uh, kind of psychiatric disorders. Um, it was just a load of questionnaires. But so IAPT is the mental health team uh, and they were really good. I can't speak highly enough of at least my experience with IAPT when I've been in Coventry. And the outcome was that this is actually pretty normal. Um, during stressful periods, that can really exacerbate things like this. I've never experienced anything like this before. Um, so I was a bit frightened by it, obviously. But, you know, I, I had a look at the literature. It's pretty common. It happens to a statistically pretty large number of people. And it's not things just like hearing voices, or, or not voices, but thoughts. Or it, it might be things like thinking about driving into oncoming traffic or hurting other people. Or, or things like that. So anyway, very long story short is I sort of sorted myself out. Um, I still I still had these thoughts, you know, as we went through the exam period. But at least then I knew sort of what was going on. I spoke to a few of my friends at med school about it. I really should have spoken to my parents about it, but I didn't really want to worry them until I had at least been through what would have been the diagnostic process uh, myself, just because if it came to nothing, and it was nothing clinically significant, that meant they didn't have to worry about it. In retrospect, that was probably wrong. I should have maybe spoken to them about it, but here we are. I guess you live and learn. So why is this really important? The reason that it's really important, and it is, is because if you have a condition like this, or, or something like this happens to you, or something not like this, you know, but a mental health problem happens to you, you need to deal with it properly as per the med school's kind of guidance. And what that means in the first instance is going and speaking to someone about it basically as soon as you suspect something might be wrong. There's a whole host of people you could go and see, people like your personal tutor, your clinical tutor when you get those, the professionalism and well-being team. There's the MedSoc welfare officer, the mental health team on the main campus separate from the medical school. And I think virtually always you should go and see your GP. And it's really crucial that you do this because it demonstrates to the medical school that you have been open in communicating with them. And if you go and see any of these people, they should be making a record of what you're saying to them and the date on which you saw them. Because this comes into play when you submit any mitigating evidence before you sit your end of the year exams. And obviously mitigating evidence um, you might be familiar with. It's anything that you feel might hinder your exam performance when it comes on the day that might adversely affect your mark. Basically, if it's bad, if it's freaking you out, like my thing was freaking me out because I didn't know what was going on and I thought I might be in danger, essentially from myself, it was adversely affecting my studies. I was stressing out about it and I didn't need that stress. That's what kind of convinced me to actually go and speak to them. And at least in my own experience, I found the med school to be very supportive. Essentially how it works is there's a time window before you sit your exams and you have a deadline by which you need to submit any mitigating circumstances and details and evidence thereof if you're going to do it. The med school is really, really clear um, about this, by the way, so don't worry about it. They'll, they'll give you all the documentation and things you need when it becomes relevant. But basically, the earlier you start communicating with the medical school, the earlier you start getting help and the more evidence you have kind of chalked up of having been to see people, you have doctor's letters and recordings of the meetings with your tutor or whatever, your case is likely to be a lot stronger when it comes to dealing with mitigating circumstances. So it is in your best interest to try and get help if you think you need it. And I know that there are going to be people that I know that, that aren't happy with the way that I've framed this. I think mental health is such, such a difficult thing to talk about in these situations. But the reason I think it's important is that your mitigating circumstances can be rejected if the evidence you submit is not good enough. If you can't prove that you sought help for your condition, then you're going to have a much harder time trying to get allowances. And things like that might make the difference between being able to resit the year should your exams go badly and being asked to leave. But I just want to make it so, so clear that what I've talked about 
represents only my own experience, not anyone else's. Everyone's will be different. And we obviously don't talk to one another for confidentiality reasons about these things. But this upset with my mental health was a, a really new thing for me this year. It did freak me out a lot. I was quite scared. For a little while, I just didn't know how to broach the topic properly with anyone. I didn't talk to anyone about it when I started having it. And the thing is, it has actually really kind of changed my view of a lot of, of a lot of things when it comes to mental health, because in my case, you know, I was stressed out by it. It was different and it was new, but I didn't have things like you know, cycling with my mood or thoughts of suicide or, you know, excessive isolation or loneliness or whatever. I didn't have a lot of those problems that I know many, many people out there, many of you watching this probably will have to deal with every day. And I can't possibly know what that's like, nor what I claim to. And what I actually decided to do was I, I filled out the forms to submit for mitigating circumstances. And in the end, I didn't, I actually didn't submit because there was a part of me that went, you know, you know what, I, I clearly have some problems um, or I have a problem that I'm dealing with that's kind of been dealt with. I found out that there's nothing clinically wrong and it's fairly normal. I actually felt guilty um, about the idea of submitting it in the end, which is why I didn't. I'd filled out all the forms ready to hand in and, and I didn't do it because I thought, even though I've had this problem, I know it's nothing like what many of my colleagues, you know, in the year, in the same situation as me, have probably had to deal with, but that I know some of them have had to, to deal with that have told me. That maybe wasn't the best decision, looking back. I was actually advised by the person that I spoke to that I actually could have still submitted, because I had been affected by the 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 unknown the uncertainty of it all it had had an adverse effect which itself would have been maybe grounds for consideration none of these things are definite that's the thing it, it's down to the assessment group but just if you are in that situation at least talk to as many people as you can about it get the evidence together and just do what you can. It, it's really not worth a rejected mitigating circumstances situation if you, you don't engage as fully as you can. And again, this is why it's so, so difficult for me to talk about things like this, because there will be people who feel like they have very good evidence and have engaged as fully as they can. And maybe they have. Their mitigating circumstances still get rejected. This happens at medical schools everywhere. I've read enough of these posts on the student room and places like that about this. And it's where my knowledge on the subject really runs out. I, I don't know anything about how those processes work. But I thought this video would at least be a chance for me to talk about what happened to me, how I dealt with it, rightly or wrongly. I'm not convinced I made the best decisions in any case. It was a new thing for me. But I thought I could at least start that dialogue with you guys and get my experience of what it was like out there, just in case any of you guys are worried about dealing with something similar or have dealt with something similar before, it could at least be on here. And, and I hope that someone watching finds it at least a little bit useful. So that's where I'm going to wrap this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I know it's been a bit of a long, drawn out, rambly thing, but I just really felt like it needed to be made and I, and I wanted to have this conversation. So thank you for watching. Um, please be sure to, to hit the like button if you fancy it. Subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to see more videos, you can go and check out postgradmedic.com to go and check out my daily blog of med school and find a load more videos and articles just like this one. Take care and I'll see you soon.